Good morning, and welcome one and all to First Congregational Church of Houston. We're glad you're choosing to worship with us this morning. First Congregational Church is a church of extravagant welcome, and so we'd like to extend that same extravagant welcome to you. So regardless of whether you are watching this somewhere in Houston, Texas, or anywhere else in the country, regardless of whether you're watching it alone or with friends and family, regardless of your age or your race, your gender, your ethnicity, your sexual orientation or gender identity, Regardless of where you are on the journey of faith, we're glad you're with us this morning, and we hope that you can find joy and peace with God as we lift up our voices in prayer and praise. Now, if you are joining us for the first time this morning, I invite you to go to our website and download a copy of our order of service. In that order of service, not only will you find convenient listings of of how the service is laid out, but also you'll find announcements of all the fun things that are coming up here at First Congregational Church. And even though we are separated by virtue of this coronavirus, we'd like to make sure that you can be as involved as possible. And if you are a first-time visitor, I encourage you to please send me an email. My email address is john, J-O-N, at fcc-houston.org. I look forward to hearing from you. And now, let us raise our voices and sing. And now, let us pray. O Lord, our God, teach us to ask aright for the right blessings. Show us the course wherein we should go, and steer the vessel of our life toward thyself, thy tranquil haven of all storm-tossed souls. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is Exodus 3, 1 through 15. Here begins the reading. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then God said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. 
And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land and to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they may ask me, What is God's name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. God said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Here ends the reading. Good morning, everybody. My name is Peter Overland, and it is time for the children's message. We just heard the story about Moses and the burning bush. Moses was a young guy when this happened, and I would like all of you who are young or young at heart to imagine yourself as a young shepherd walking with Moses. Can you see the flames? Can you smell the smoke and hear the crackling sounds of the burning bush? It must have been an incredible sight. Did you know that fire is an important part of the history of the world? Have you ever heard of the Big Bang? I'll show you some illustrations. Scientists tell us that the beginning of all the stars and planets happened because of a very tiny and very hot event called the Big Bang. It was kind of like a little hot spark that spread out in a fiery hot ball at the beginning of the universe. Use your imagination to think of all the energy and matter in the universe spreading out from that tiny, hot spark called the Big Bang. It happened billions and billions of years ago. Nobody was around to witness it, not even the dinosaurs. But it was an event of biblical proportions. So let's fast forward several billion years. The indigenous peoples of North America knew about fire. Just like Moses, they used fire carefully for cooking food and staying warm in the winter. The indigenous peoples also knew that natural fires were part of the ecology of the forests. Ecology means the understanding of how plants and animals respond to their physical surroundings. Here are some pictures. Every summer, there would be some thunder and lightning storms. Sometimes a tree would be hit by lightning and causing it to start a fire in the forest. These small fires would burn out the older dead trees and make space for new grass and small bushes to grow. The forest animals would then be able to eat the healthy young grass and little bushes. These lightning fires would happen many times, and it was a natural process of new growth. Have you ever watched a lightning storm? They can be beautiful and a bit scary. I'll show you some more pictures. One of my earliest childhood memories was watching a lightning fire that burned in the forest near my hometown in Montana. It was fascinating and it made me a bit nervous. 
In fact, if we fast forward to today, there are several small forest fires in Montana right now. These happen every summer during fire season, and the foresters are working hard to keep everyone safe. They do this to protect people and also preserve the fire's natural ecology. So remember, my young friends, if you see something burning, keep a safe distance away and make sure to tell an adult immediately. And this is how you can remember today's Bible story about Moses and the burning bush. Moses was a young man when he saw the fire, and he told the adults about it right away. God gave him confidence to do the right thing because he needed encouragement. Let's say a little prayer together. Dear God, thank you for letting us learn about fire. And thank you for teaching us about your love for humanity. Thank you for this story about Moses and the burning bush. Amen. now please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Moses had his new life. He had a wife and a great job working for his father-in-law. The trauma and shock of his old life in Egypt was far behind him. Occasionally, he would still hear the voices the voice of his mother who adopted him out of the water, the voices of his fellow Hebrews struggling under Pharaoh's lash, the scream of the Egyptian he killed, the voices whispering that he needed to go back. But the voices only came to Moses in the dark times of the night, when everything is still and his mind won't let him sleep. Then he would look at his wife sleeping next to him and smile. He reminded himself that life was good. Moses loved taking his flock up to the mountains near where they lived. In the cool shadows of the mountains, grass grew that the sheep loved. It also gave him a chance to get away from everyone else. Something about being on his own amidst the muddy mountains in nature soothed his soul. The air was different up there, and Moses could feel the breezes float off the Red Sea in the distance. Then one day, while on Mount Horeb, which had always been his favorite of the mountains, he heard something, or he thought he heard something. He followed the direction of the voice, and as he walked around a boulder, he saw it. There was a bush, but unlike any bush Moses had seen. It seemed to be consumed with flames, but the leaves and wood were still intact. He would have expected to feel the heat of the flames against his skin, but his body was oddly cool, even tingling. He felt drawn to this bush, not just by curiosity, but by some inner compulsion, inner force. Then he heard it, a voice calling out to him from amidst the bush, Moses, Moses. He responded, here I am. Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. When the full weight of what was happening dawned on Moses, he was afraid. His first instinct was to cover his face with his cloak. Then he bent down, still not looking at the bush, and carefully removed his sandals. His bare feet felt the dirt underneath him, 
And something about the ground, this ground, brought him peace. He was ready to face God. Moments like this have long fascinated me. Theophanies is what they're called. Those moments when God's presence becomes manifest to us. God is, of course, always present to us. God is around us and within us, but normally we're not aware of God's presence. God can seem oddly distant for how close God actually is. But then there are those times when something changes. The air around us becomes somehow different and we become aware. It's much like the calm that descended on us this past Wednesday night when Hurricane Laura passed near the coast. Even though we were blessedly far from the storm, there was that time when the air stood still. The birds stopped chirping. The color of the sky changed. Our sense of perception was altered as though there was something about to happen, but we didn't know quite what. I like to go on walks in my neighborhood. A few blocks from my house, there is a small city park, the smallest park, in fact, in the whole city. It was a park donated nearly 30 years ago by a couple who owned the land. The tiny park is dominated by one thing, a massive live oak tree. It's one of the more remarkable living things I've seen. Sometimes I will stop and stare at that tree, letting my eyes trace its many limbs and the deep creases made by the bark. That tree is alive, alive in the sense of something that is very old and also deeply of God. It is a holy spot, and I've been tempted at various times to sit on the small bench near the tree and remove my shoes so I can feel the energy emanating from the tree in my bare feet. There are times when God's presence seems very real to us, and in those times, if we can quiet our mind, we can almost hear God speak. The message that Moses heard from God on Mount Horeb that day is a profound one. We've heard this story so many times that it can be easy for us to miss. God says, I have observed, I have heard, I know. God reveals a sensitivity to the actions of human beings. Psalm 8 famously declares in the old King James language, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Amidst the vastness and glory of all creation, God somehow observes, hears, and knows the human experience. God is watching. God is watching you and me. And what is it that disturbs God? What is it that catches God's attention amidst all the noise and cacophony of life? God hears and knows human suffering. God hears the cries of the Israelites in bondage. That is what comes to God's ears more than anything else. Slavery, while slavery is still a major problem around the world today, we don't experience that kind of bondage in our lives. As a result, it's easy to assume that a passage like this one has little relevance for us. And yet, as horrific as slavery is, there are, there are other types of bondage. Situations that keep us in chains and lead to suffering. If there's one thing that this coronavirus crisis has taught us, it is the psychological damage that can result from social isolation. Humans are, by nature, social beings. Even the introverts among us crave human contact. We can only watch so much TV or read so many books. We need other people to discover happiness and to be our true selves. Many of us have tight social networks that have allowed us to have vibrant social contact during this crisis, but that is not true of all of us, and it is certainly not true of many in society. Zoom calls are great, but they're not the same as being with other people. Talking and socializing can be life-giving, but there are no substitutes for human touch. I'm someone for whom human touch matters tremendously. I'm a hugger, for sure. I love giving hugs. One of my friends, who's a medical researcher, told me once that human touch can release oxytocin, a chemical that brings us happiness and reduces anxiety. As a pastoral caregiver, I was taught how healing touch can be for people. Being able to hold someone's hand while you lie in a hospital bed, 
or give someone a hug in the midst of grief. These things are powerful things. But in the time of corona, so many are left alone and isolated without human touch. Death from drug overdoses have spiked across the country. Anyone prone to depression has seen bouts of that horrible darkness descend. When you get caught in depression, it can seem like there's no way out. You are trapped, literally, in the bondage of your mind, and you suffer. Other forms of psychological bondage we know too well. The expectations of others can leave us trapped. We are expected to be a certain way, to act a certain way, to talk a certain way, to dress a certain way. If you're someone who doesn't fit into the community in which you find yourself, you can feel trapped. I'm sure many of us have found ourselves in that situation. Perhaps you felt like you were constantly disappointing your parents by not living up to what they thought you should be. Do you remember how that felt? What emotions it brought to the surface, how trapped you felt? When we find ourselves not living up to expectations, either of our own or others, we fall into cycles of self-judgment that can be so damaging. That place of self-judgment can lead to bad decisions, which only create a vicious cycle. I know people who have been caught in these cycles, and they feel like there's no way out. They are in bondage. Grief is another all-too-familiar form of psychological bondage. When speaking of grief, Emily Dickinson wrote, After great pain, a formal feeling comes. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. The feet mechanical go round. Of ground or air or aught a wooden way. This is the hour of lead. Remembered if outlived, as freezing persons recollect the snow, first chill, then stupor, then the letting go. Elsewhere she wrote, Parting is all we know of heaven and all we need of hell. The bondage of grief can last for months or years, always knocking at the door at the most inconvenient times, paralyzing us. Beyond the various forms of psychological bondage, there is the more physical manifestations of it. You might be caught in a cycle at work that seems never-ending, without rest. Your work grinds you down until you feel like dust, yet you need the job and feel helpless to locate a way out. Others feel bondage when their, humi- when their humanity is denied. I think of Langston Hughes' great poem, A Dream Deferred, which explores the suffering under racism when, finally, that rage builds until it explodes. And God hears, God observes, God knows. Those words sound nice and reassuring, but they're often cold comfort to those who are in bondage. So often, in fact, most of the time, those in bondage are not capable of freeing themselves. That is, after all, the very definition of bondage. Someone in the midst of depression cannot simply be happy. Someone locked in isolation often cannot find a way out. Someone weighed down by grief or expectations or struggling with oppression cannot free himself or herself. It's nice to know that God sees, observes our pain, but then what? What are we to do? This is where the text can be so enlightening. God does not ask the Israelites to free themselves. God does not appear in Egypt in a burning bush or miraculously break the chains of the Israelites. God appears to Moses. And Moses is not some superhuman person, not at all. When confronted by God in the burning bush, when in the very presence of God and called on to deliver the Israelites from bondage, Moses demurs. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? When God reassures Moses that God will be with him, Moses still tries to find a way out of the assignment. He is only Moses. But the point is that God comes down. God becomes manifest on earth. God's power is shown through Moses, even in his average, everyday self. Moses becomes God's instrument. He is strengthened by God for the task ahead. He becomes the ultimate bringer of liberation to those in bondage. 
How hopeful. If you are trapped in bondage, it is not up to you to deliver yourself. There are Moseses out there whom God is calling. If you're someone who's free from bondage, well, might you be Moses? Liberation takes many forms. Sometimes liberation can be as simple as offering a reinterpretation of life. Last summer, I found myself in a horrible relationship that left me angry. Angry at my ex for how he had treated me. It was not a fun place to be. Try as, I, try as I might, my anger seemed to resurface constantly. I felt trapped in this cycle where I was trying to be the better person, but my emotions kept getting in the way. Then Moses came to me in the form of my good friend Taylor. He had seen every step of the relationship. In the midst of one of my angry rants, Taylor stopped me. He pointed out that when I met my ex, who he was was clear to see, but I chose not to see who he was. I was a willing partner in trying to make the relationship work when people like Taylor told me it was a bad idea for all sorts of reasons. That day, Taylor looked me straight in the eye and said, John, the reality is that you brought this on yourself. Your ex was just being the person he was, and you're angry that he didn't miraculously transform himself into the person you wanted him to be. The truth is, you have no one to blame but yourself. Those weren't exactly easy words to hear, but Taylor was right. And I have to say, that reframing of my relationship helped my anger evaporate. I was freed from my cycle of anger, and I felt immeasurably better. The reinterpretation of my circumstance brought liberation. The other day, I was reading through a collection of poems when I ran across one entitled, to the American Psychiatric Association, 1973. The poem is in reference to the famous adjustment that the American Psychiatric Association made when it removed homosexuality from the list of mental health problems. That year, the professionals declared that being gay was not a psychological disorder. It was human and natural. For this poet, that moment allowed her to see how much self-judgment she had carried how she had beaten herself up and saw herself as somehow flawed. She concludes her poem, Then I woke up this morning, no longer just that crazy lesbian footnoted in texts, but a feminist who's still quite angry. Liberation takes other forms as well. For people caught in the bondage of depression or grief, it can be as simple as walking alongside someone. The other day, I found myself in such a moment of depression. These phases, blessedly, usually have not lasted long in my life. But when they strike, they can be debilitating. For an evening and most of the next day, I felt trapped and alone. I knew I needed to do something, but I didn't know what. So I let that dark cloud oppress me, and I prayed it would pass. Then my phone rang. It was the Reverend Dan de Leon, the minister of the UCC Church in College Station. He was calling to talk through the coronavirus strategies for church. We talked for maybe 20 minutes about church and life and how we can minister in this difficult time. And you know what? By the time the call ended, I could already feel some of that cloud lifting. Then later, a close friend of mine, Lucas, who had just got back to town, dropped by to say hi. Lucas is one of those people who has this incredibly strong, positive energy. He came bounding up the stairs of my town home with a beaming smile and came over to give me a big hug. We caught up for a bit before I got back to work, but those few moments with someone I care about transformed my day. Since then, I felt like my old self again. All it took to feel free again? A talk with a colleague, a hug from a friend, Moses walking alongside. Another potent form of liberation, one that we are loath to accept in most circumstances, is material help. To accept any material help is seen as a sign of weakness, that we are somehow a failure. Asking for help, even when we need it, can be so difficult. Our pride keeps getting in the way. But sometimes the need is real. When I graduated from Yale Divinity School, I had spent all my savings, 
desperately trying to graduate without debt. I was certainly one of the lucky ones since I was able to do that through a generous scholarship, working during school, and the savings that I had. After graduating, I had secured my first job, but that job did not start until the end of August, and my savings had run out. Moreover, I had one final requirement to fulfill in order to qualify for ordination. I had to do clinical pastoral education, the training program to become a hospital chaplain. The UCC, like many mainline churches, requires that candidates complete at least one unit of this program to get ordained. It's a wonderful education, and I had been admitted to the program at Mass General Hospital in Boston. There was just one problem. I didn't have the money to pay for it. So I did something I'd resisted the whole time during divinity school. I called up the minister of my home church, Matt Fitzgerald. Matt and I met in his office, and I explained my situation. Afterwards, Matt sat back and looked at me for a moment. Then, without hesitation, he said, Don't worry about it, John. The church will cover it. I looked at him, unsure of what to say. I didn't think something like that was in the church's budget. Fortunately, he said, when he saw my hesitation, I have plenty of money in my pastor's discretionary fund. I'll cover the cost of the program from that. We're all proud of you. It's the least we can do. I was overcome with emotion. Sometimes material things do make all the difference. When I was living in Massachusetts and writing before taking this job here at FCC, I got my health insurance from Mass Health which is Massachusetts's program to help those with minimal incomes have health insurance. That was another time when I, needed the help I, when I needed the help and got it. And boy, I was grateful for it. That is one reason why I get so angry at politicians in Texas who have made the decision, made the conscious decision, to refuse Medicaid expansion to score political points. People have to suffer so that certain conservatives can remain supposedly pure in their opposition to health care relief. And people, people in desperate need, suffer. Few things incense me quite so much. I have to remind myself to breathe. <laughs> to breathe, and then to vote. Sometimes we find ourselves, in the midst of our lives, on holy ground. God appears to us in the mundane and... For a moment, time slows down. Those are treasured moments. And one thing God tells us in those moments is that God observes, God hears, and God knows of human suffering, of human bondage. And sometimes we find ourselves in a place of bondage, in those spots where we are lost and feel trapped and are unsure of any way out. Don't worry. It's not up to you to free yourself. Because you know what? Somewhere God is whispering to an average person, a Moses, to do some work, some God work, the work of liberation. And if you are lucky enough to find yourself as Moses someday, if you are in the place where you can be the manifestation of God in someone else's life, if you can offer a bit of freedom and liberation from suffering, praise God for it. Praise her with your whole heart and act. Listen to the call. Life has plenty of suffering on its own. Just ask those who are suffering now in Louisiana. We don't need to go looking very hard to find it. But sometimes we get that gift to be able to offer some relief, small though it may be. And in the midst of that seemingly insignificant action, someone who feels trapped can see a burning bush and hear God herself.
And now, join me in a time of prayer. In the wake of the devastation of Hurricane Laura, let us pray for all those who are in the storm's path. Most holy and gracious God, whose presence supports us when we need it most, we pray this morning for all those suffering in the wake of the devastation of Hurricane Laura. For all those who lost their homes or whose homes were inundated with water. For all those whose places of work have been ruined. For those whose lives were lost and for those who are grieving. May your abundant love and mercy be with the people of Louisiana as they rebuild. May you inspire people to work together for the good of their broken communities. And may this destruction remind us of how tenuous our lives can be so that we may appreciate every good moment that flows from you. Amen. And in the midst of continued racial tension and unrest in our nation, may we pray for justice. God, we hear in our minds that ringing phrase of Martin Luther King Jr., how long? How long must our nation wrestle with the scars of our past? For how long will unarmed people of color be victims of police violence? Move all of us to seek a deeper understanding of the racial history of our nation. Inspire those in power to work for sensible reforms to our law enforcement to make everyone in our communities safer. And open our eyes to our own racial biases that we might continue the work of healing and wholeness so that our nation might someday become a better reflection of your kingdom. Amen. And finally, let us pray for all those who are in bondage of any sort today. God, in the midst of the ongoing crisis in our nation, help us remember those who are stuck in bondage and cannot find their way out. We pray for all who are alone and facing isolation. We pray for all who suffer from depression and grief which can rend the soul and leave us lost. We pray for all those whose humanity is denied or who, or who feel trapped in an unhealthy work or home situations. Call out among us, as you did with Moses before the burning bush, those who can be your very presence for those who need it. Remind us that we are your hands in this world and that even small actions can transform lives. May we be the change that is needed so that all your children can breathe the air of true freedom and liberation. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, the great liberator. Amen. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. I'm Teresa Cannon, and we come now to our time of offering. Our family has been attending First Congregational Church for about the last year, and we've been richly blessed by the beautiful music, the powerful preaching that addresses relevant social justice issues, and the friendly people that we've met. FCC has helped us grow in our love for God and our love for our neighbor. We ask you to consider all the wonderful things that God has done for you and the good work of this congregation. Out of a spirit of gratitude, we invite you to donate to the life of this congregation. You can give electronically through the FCC website, through text, or through Zelle, which is the preferred method of giving electronically. Instructions are listed in the bulletin. Thank you.
Now join me as we say together our mission. Welcome all into an inclusive community. Seek to follow Jesus' teachings. Search for more truth and light. Support one another on our faith journeys. Strive for peace and justice. And now before I let you go, there are a few brief announcements I'd like to make. The first is that this upcoming week, we've got some fun things going on. You can join us on Wednesday at noon for our weekly midweek prayer service. You can join us uh, Friday at noon uh, for our men's lunch uh, via Zoom, and you can join us Friday night at our Fiesta Fridays, a chance to gather in person here on, here on the FCC campus. And also, this is the time when we are launching our new, our new set semester of growth groups, our small group program here at FCC. So if you want to have the chance to get to know people better, to learn some great things, to deepen your friendships, then this is something for you. All of the growth groups are listed on our website. I invite you to go there under the Get Involved tab and you can see more information about them. Fill them out, sign up for something. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email or an email to Kelly Stevens. We'd love to have you be involved. Finally, uh, we are also collecting signups for our Slumber Falls weekend. So again, pending the coronavirus crisis and hoping that it gets better and better, uh, we would like to have a chance to go down to Slumber Falls, New Braunfels, to have a retreat with our church family together. So if you'd like to know more information about that, it is in your order of service. And now, receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up her countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. Amen.